whenever we go before, into the Word of God, we want to do it with prayer. So let's just do that right now. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your Word. And we pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit, that it would open that Word to our lives. We thank you, especially for this study of Hosea. We pray, Father, that you would help us appropriate it to our own times and appropriate its lessons to our own priorities and behavior. As we commit this evening and ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we are in the book of Hosea, and we're completing it tonight. These last two chapters, which happen to be quite short, will wrap up our review of this unusual book. Uh, it's unusual in several ways. It has some very distinctive lessons hermeneutically, that is in terms of understanding Scripture in general, but it also has some very specific potential application to our own predicament that we find ourselves in in our own country right now. So we are in the book of Hosea, and just by a little bit way of review, you may recall that when Solomon dies, the nation of Israel divided into two houses. They had a civil war. Rehoboam, his son, took the southern kingdom, the house of Judah, and there are 20 kings listed there, but one dynasty, David, David all the way. Jeroboam rebelled and spun off the northern kingdom, and he also was the first of about 20 kings, but nine different dynasties. Some of them served as long as a month, killing each other off and what have you. Very dismal thing. But uh, the first kings, the book of 1 Kings covers the first part and the second kings the remainder. But the point is, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse. It's a, just a downward spiral, spiral, spiral from uh, the Lord's uh, preferences. And it goes from bad to worse, as I say. And it embraces a period from about 931 B.C. for about two centuries to 721 B.C., where finally, as you'll see, the, uh, the, the Assyrians wipe them off the map, to use an Iranian phrase, <laughs> that the nation was when in, not only did it go into captivity, but it was distributed throughout the Assyrian Empire. It lost its identity as that nation. Don't confuse the idea of the tribes being lost because the faithful from all the tribes migrated south where it, was fat, where it was politically correct to worship in the temple. The people who were leaning towards idolatry in all tribes migrated north where it was politically correct to bow before these two golden calves at Bethel and, and uh, in the tribe of Dan. And so uh, uh, there's a distinct difference. The southern kingdom went from about 931 to about 100 years longer, almost 100 years longer than the, uh, in fact, more than 100 years longer, 120, 115 years longer, uh, in which the southern kingdom did not get wiped out. It went into captivity from which it returned with integrity. And, uh, but, the, uh, but the point really I'm getting at is you'll discover that the house of Judah did have five good kings out of the whole list. Again, about 20 guys but one dynasty. Um, something that's worth understanding for a lot of reasons is the, how, the southern kingdom calling itself the house of Judah deserved more punishment than the northern. The northern kingdom went unabashedly into idolatry. But there are passages which point out that the southern kingdom should have learned by that and because they didn't, they were even more culpable. So much so that at the very end, God even pronounces a blood curse on the house of Je Jeconiah, and there's a whole story behind that that leads to the virgin birth and so on. But the point I'm getting at is the reason the southern kingdom did not get the punishment they deserved wasn't that they didn't deserve it. It's because of God's promise to David. And one of the, the, the realities that is not taught in general in the Christian community is the significance of the unconditional covenant that God made with David. And that covenant was confirmed by Gabriel to Mary when her child was uh, uh, to be born. And it was also confirmed by James at the Council of Jerusalem in the book of Acts and so on. The point is that the millennium is a fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And that happens to shatter 
the perception of much of what is taught in, in, uh, in uh, the uh, traditional denominations, the, the, the amillennialism that pervades our, our, our misunderstanding of the Scripture. So I mention that so as you study your Bible and get grounded, pay attention not to what I say or any particular... Pay attention to what the Bible really says and do your own study because you'll discover much of what we've been taught needs to be reviewed. The northern kingdom is the subject of Hosea's ministry, okay? It had a few, the, the last uh, uh, half a dozen kings, Jeroboam the second, and uh, we won't get into all that here, but just by way of review, uh, Jeroboam the first was the one that spun them off from the north, that had the civil war. There's about 20 of these guys, but the last six are listed here at the, the, during the, the era of, of um, Hosea. Hosea is the last king, and it's in his, uh, that ends the kingdom. And uh, the southern kingdom also, we have the final few here, and uh, 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 that are contemporaneous, if you will, with Hosea. And so, uh, as foreseen by Hosea, the Assyrians are going to be God's instrument to... Uh, they expanded westward, and the northern kingdom be, became a puppet state about 733. And they plotted revolt against their bosses, so to speak. And the Assyrians explained it to them more clearly by uh, uh, leveling the place. Samaria was their capital. So they not only took them all captives and distributed them in their empire, they took other peop- other captives in their empire and moved them there. And that caused an, a mix, an inbreeding, a mix. Uh, breeding of the people. That's what led to the Samaritans, sometimes called by some the half-Jews. That's where it all starts, really. But anyway, during this era, we have God's prophets under, under, uh, to, the northern, to the southern kingdom. We have a whole series of prophets that lead to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah weep, is called the weeping prophet because he had a role parallel to what Hosea had to do because Jeremiah, in effect, had to um, officiate over the demise of his nation. And uh, he had to deal with that. But in uh, the northern kingdom, we have a series of prophets. We have these crazy guys, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, Elijah was such a phenomenal character in many ways. Elisha had a lot of, had more chutzpah than Elijah did because he wanted a double portion. He didn't want to only be like Elijah. He wanted to have a double portion. And so if you study Elijah, you'll discover there were eight primary miracles. If you study Elisha, you discover there's 16. Are you surprised? He called a double portion. Anyway, we get to Jonah, Amos, and then Hosea. And that Hosea is the Hosea, obviously, we're studying here. Uh, and, uh, but he's, a contemporary, he's contemporaneous with Isaiah uh, and also with Amos. And, uh, yeah, but he's, of course, his focus is the northern kingdom, not the southern kingdom. And his message, though, in, in, encompassed the whole people of God. He often talks about the southern kingdom also. He includes it in some of his visions. What's the doctrine here? There isn't any other messenger that gives a, as complete an outline of the ways of God with his earthly people as does Hosea. That means Hosea is fundamental to our understanding of God himself. And that's very important for that reason. And what does he learn? That God suffers when his people are unfaithful. Did you know you can make God suffer? That idea blows me away. We think of God as sort of untouchable. He's everything. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And, you know, we, we deal in all the superlatives. It's hard for us to grasp the idea that we can grieve him, that we can cause him to suffer. That sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? It's hard for us to grasp that. But that's part of what we're going to learn, that he suffers when his people are unfaithful. Any parent that's had an ungrateful child knows that kind of pain. It's not the kind of pain you can punish for. Rebellion or, dis, or, or, you know, disbehaving you can deal with. What do you do with ingratitude? That's God's problem. But God cannot condone sin. That's a fundamental part of his nature. We need to understand that. And God will never cease to love his own. Think about that. He will never cease to love his own. But how painful that must be when his own lock themselves in ingratitude. And it's because of that he seeks to win back those that have forsaken him. Now, Hosea's message is often summarized. I do it very time. I know many authors do this. They summarize it with the first line of Charles Dickens' famous novel, The Tale of Two Cities. It opens up saying it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. That sounds like a self-contradictory phrase, and it is in a sense. 
But that re-describes the predicament that Hosea is dealing with. The northern kingdom had enjoyed material prosperity unequal since the days of Solomon. That's pretty impressive. Jeroboam the, the first recovered all the territory lost to Israel, even the possession of Damascus. And uh, we need to understand that material prosperity is not a guarantee uh, of safety to those people whose stability rests not on the moral basis of fear of God and obedience to his laws. That's what, it, that's what our peace really depends on. So, but if you ask the northern pe- kingdom, the people themselves, you go to the man on the street with a, with a taking a pole, they'd say it's the best of times. Why? Many of them had two houses. They had material prosperity. Everything was great. Their stock indexes were at the highest. They, were, they owned several cars. They had three-car garages. They, I'm being facetious. God's perspective, however, was just the opposite. It was the worst of times from his, through his glasses. And he sent Hosea to correct their misapprehension. In fact, the large portion of the book will sound like a prosecutor's case before a jury. Here is the indictments, and here's the evidence that they deserve judgment. So Hosea's message, and much like his 8th century contemporaries, Amos and Isaiah and Micah, has to be understood against Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 highlights the covenant between God and the nation Israel. Israel was to maintain loyalty to the Lord by worshiping Him alone and obeying His commandments. That's straightforward enough, isn't it? Obedience would bring blessing. And that's the first half of Deuteronomy 28, the blessings from verses 1 to 14. Disobedience, on the other hand, would bring judgment and eventual exile. And that's the last half of Deuteronomy 28. And part of your preparation for this book, you should read and understand Deuteronomy 28. Now, Hosea emphasized idolatry and compared Israel's relationship as spiritual adultery. And that's a deliberate pun. It's obviously speaking not of sexual adultery in the usual denotative sense. It's speaking in a much broader uh, sense, spiritual adultery. And he uses his own marriage to an unfaithful woman as an illustration by God's instruction. He also, his reconciliation to that unfaithful woman is intended to illustrate Israel's ultimate restoration. God is not through with Israel even today. They will be restored. That's something else that many, many churches deny. They're victims of a, a, a view that's called replacement theology that somehow the church has replaced Israel. That is not biblical, unfortunately. Now, there are other sins that Hosea will detail, or God will detail through Hosea. Social injustice, violent crime, religious hypocrisy, political rebellion, foreign alliances, selfish arrogance, spiritual ingratitude. You'd think that I took this out of today's newspaper. No, I took it out of Hosea. Does any of this sound familiar, though? Sounds like Fox News, doesn't it? In addition to exposing the nation's breach of the covenant and God's intention to implement judgment, Hosea also confirmed the Deuteronomic promise of ultimate restoration. This is not a negative book. It it holds out despite all this and despite the fact that judgment was coming, they would be ultimately restored, and that's Deuteronomy 30. So the major themes of Hosea's message of sin, judgment, and salvation... And his style is very strange. We learn a lot from it. His style is abrupt, sententious, unrounded. The connecting particles are few. They are, they, there's a change of person, anomalies of gender, number, and construction. His very name, by the way, means salvation, Hosea. So there are all kinds of quotes in the New Testament. Out of Egypt I've called my son. There's a whole hermeneutic lesson behind that I won't try to repeat here in our review. I'll have mercy, not sacrifice. That's echoes in many passages. Uh, in there, and my people which were not, and so on. O death, where is thy sting? There is the the most remarkable ellipsis of reversal that we'll deal with when we get to verse 14 of chapter 13 shortly, and it's the reversal gets answered by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. It's another one of these interesting evidences of design of the whole package, by the way. And my people which were not, and so on. Okay, the outline of the book. The first three chapters deal with Hosea's married life. Is the names of his three children and his adultery is the prostitute that he marries as a, a, a wife. 
From chapters 4 through 13 is a prosecutor's indictment of Israel's unfaithfulness and the coming judgment that's, that's on its way. But it's the upbeat, final wrap-up is a very little passage, uh, passage called chapter 14. It's con- Israel's ultimate conversion and renewal. So we have the, hi- the history of Israel summarized in the names of his three children. First one is named Jezreel, which has two different meanings. It means, one meaning is that they are scattered. And that refers, of course, to the time when they would, he would scatter Israel among the nations. The next two children, Lo Ruma, which means unpitied, Ruhamah means pitied. Lo means no, not, not pitied. Meaning God would lift his mercy from the nation and permit her to suffer her for her sins. Lo ami means not my people. God actually declares for a time they are not his people. I thought they were the chosen people. Yes, they were. And they will be again. But there's a time that they were not my people. Indicating the present time in God's program when Israel is out of fellowship with God and its people are not his people as once they were. That may shock many people, but there it is in Hosea in chapter 1 through 3. Now, all three children, though, before the chapter 3 finishes, are regathered and embraced. Jezreel means also, not only scattered, it means sown or planted. That's an, also the valley of Jezreel is what you and I think of as Armageddon, by the way. And, and lo, Ruamah becomes Ruamah. He, they do have pit, mercy and pity, and their name is changed from Lo-Ami to Ami, which means my people. So there's a closure, if you will. And by the way, all this is quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 9. Uh, the New Testament commentary on all this is Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul hammers away that God is not finished with Israel. They have a destiny. And also Peter deals with that. Okay. It's important for us not to lose sight of, we're going to see that in chapter 14 especially, that despite all these indictments of Israel and the judgment that's coming, the book emphasizes their ultimate national repentance and restoration. It's strange that there are so many scholars, and I'm amused by the label. It must have been done by Congress. You know, they always, you know, um, um, what did Mark Twain say? Assume you're an idiot and assume you're a congressman, but I, I repeat myself. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so many scholars, and they call themselves reform scholars, <laughs> still deny that there will be a regathering of Israel. They haven't looked on May 14th to 48th, that, that debate should have ended. And a national repentance is yet coming in the days ahead. That They have not experienced that yet. And uh, these guys argue that Israel's failure when she rejected Christ caused them to forfeit and, f- the, f- the, the, and uh, the fulfillment will be in the church. The tragedy with that view is that it tends to make God a liar because both the Old and the New Testament are full of promises to Israel that thus become forfeit or of no effect. So you want to be careful of that because it's okay for a lot of good scholars to have different views, but you want to be careful when your view may be contradicting God's character in some way. Anyway, the promise of Israel's regathering and restoration made all through the Old Testament. We won't go through all here. And they're repeated in the New Testament. And they were repeated, not only they repeated in the New Testament, they're repeated in the New Testament following the rejection of Christ. That's an important point. And uh, in the opening verses of Romans 11, it is clearly not true that God has utterly cast off his people. In fact, that's what Paul directly contradicts. And he highlights this peculiar interval of focus and opportunity for the Gentiles. Then he goes on to restate and further define the Old Testament prophecies of a time of future blessing when Israel is blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And then he goes on to describe what's going to happen. And, uh, but they still have not returned to the Lord. And they're still in peril of losing Jerusalem. That's another thing. All of us have made mistakes in our prophetic perspectives to realize they haven't gained Jerusalem yet. June of 1967 didn't quite do it. And the United States is committed to them keeping from doing that. That makes me very nervous for America's future. But they will return and they will seek the Lord, their God, and surprisingly, David their king. Well, that must mean the son of David. That's not what it says four times. David will be resurrected. He's got a role, amazingly enough. God keeps his promise. He kept, him to, he kept his promises to Abraham. He kept his promises to Moses. He keeps his promises to David and to Mary. And he keeps them to you and me. That's why that's so important. That's why we can trust him, because of his history. 
Now, that, what we're going to see here is the formal charges, lawlessness, immorality, ignorance of God's Word. We, of course, are not guilty of that, are we? It makes me very nervous because we're guilty of all of these things. And idolatry. Covetous, covetousness is idolatry. Is there any nation on the planet Earth more committed to covetousness than America? Ooh. Then maybe we should pay attention here. God's law, while it's specifically given to Israel, sets out a pattern for any nation which wants to be blessed. Has God blessed the founding of this country? It's amazing how this country fails to understand why God blessed it. We think we did it. And here the charges are disclosed in a manner whose depth is unparalleled in the rest of the Old Testament. That's what makes Hosea so foundational. God's holiness demands an indictment for Israel's sin. God's justice requires that she should be punished. You can't escape that. There it is. How is it organized? Well, the first 10 chapters deal with the disobedience of God's people and their inevitable judgment as a consequence. That's pretty straightforward. The last four chapters that we're in, the wrap-up of, focuses on the love of God. It's going to be much more comfortable than these heavy stuff that we've been dragging through these weeks. It's interesting, when Moses went to Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. What did Pharaoh respond? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let people go? Remember? Remember Yule Brenner? You know, okay. If Pharaoh could have read the book of Hosea, he would have known several things about the Lord, why he should obey him. He would know that he's a sovereign God, first three chapters, that he's a holy God, verses chapters 4 through 7, that he's a just God, chapters 8 through 10, and that he's a loving God, chapters 11 through 14. Those four attributes of God are exemplified in an unparalleled way in the, uh, in the, in the chapters 1 through 14 of Hosea. Pharaoh never had the benefit of the depth of knowledge that Israel was given through the mouth and pen of the prophet Hosea, but Israel did have that benefit. That's the point here. And yet in spite of that, the people were as stony-hearted toward God as Pharaoh was those many centuries before. Pharaoh had an excuse. He didn't know. Israel had no excuse. And neither do we. And of course, the climax of God's plan is the final redemption of His chosen people. Everything that befell Israel was intended to destruct her and bring her back to God. Hosea then delves into the past, present, and future history of redemption for His people. So this is by way of just summarizing. We've just been through, you know, 12 chapters. I'm trying to figure out. I tried to just went through and pick up some of the highlights of our previous things. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin also calls the death, causes the death of family life, culture, movements history, and even the death of nations. We think of sin causing death personally, indeed. But it also kills the culture. It also causes the death of nations. A guy by the name of Oswald Spengler, he joined a long list of people that we've studied. That He has a massive two-volume work called The Decline of the West. And he compares the movements of history to the stages of biological life. Civilizations are born, they grow strong, they deteriorate, and finally die. Nations do. Now, he's not a believer. He's not biblically based. He's just a, you know, a historian. So he made no attempt to link this inevitable death to sin, and he apparently knows nothing of redemption, but his work nevertheless is provocative just from a sociological point of view. There are three stages he maintains. Stage one, they die in spirit first. Next, the soul of the nation dies. Its national character deteriorates. And stage three, the final stage, is when the body of the nation dies. That's his perception, and it seems to be a convenient outline of the book of Hosea. This seems to be the pattern of the northern kingdom that Hosea is dealing with. So we're going to now, after that preamble, we'll jump into chapter 13, verse 1. When Ephraim spake trembling, now by the way, Ephraim was the, the one of the uh, geographic areas that, that became the, the archetype, if you will, of the northern kingdom. There were 10 different geographical areas up there, but 
it was the biggest one. So Ephraim is used all through here. In fact, 38 times it's used idiomatically to represent the whole northern kingdom. Okay? Just like many times you'll read something about New York where they're using New York to mean the whole United States because it typifies it. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Or we might say Washington when we mean really the U.S. or something. Ephraim spake trembling, exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, that is the false god, he died is the, is the assertion. Ephraim was fully devoted to the realm of death because he's an idol worshiper. Ephraim's prominent or call it exalted, if you will, placed among the tribes of Israel. It was well known. It was a very dominant, it had a very dominant history throughout Israel's history, the tribe of Ephraim. It becomes very uh, uh, dominant, and, but it becomes idiomatic then of the whole northern kingdom. Jeroboam I, the one that really caused the civil war, he's the one that led northern kingdom secession, was an Ephraimite himself. He came from that particular tribe. But this prominent tribe had also taken the lead in Baal worship and was as good as dead is the assertion here. But I'd like to make another point for those of you that are studying your Bible. I want to talk a little bit more about Ephraim here. When you look at Revelation chapter 7, you discover from chapter 7 uh, that there's 12,000 sealed of each of 12 tribes. How many of you knew that from the book of Revelation 7? It's about 90%. Well, Okay. Got a little work to do, Dan. Yeah. Most people that look at this realize there's somebody missing. Now, how can you have how can you have twelve tribes and have one missing and still have twelve? Well, most of you that are serious students know there's really thirteen tribes. Okay, and they're listed twenty different times throughout the Bible, each time in a different order, different purposes. Now, if you go through and look at these carefully, you discover there's twelve thousand from each of twelve. Everything about the kingdom is twelve, by the way. There are 12 tribes, there are 12 apostles, the 12 apostles are going to rule over the 12 tribes, which means Paul was not one of those 12 apostles because he's an apostle of the Gentiles. We go into the whole thing here. Anyway, as you look this over, almost all Bible students who study it carefully notice there's a, uh, there is a tribe missing. Which one's missing? Dan, yes, tribe of Dan is missing. Oh my goodness, how can that be? Why not Dan? Well, prophecies. Jacob says he's going to be like a servant in, in Genesis 49. And his symbol was, uh, Hezer didn't like that, by the way. The head of the tribe didn't like the fact that their symbol, their essence was a, a serpent. So he put the serpent in the mouth of an eagle and made the eagle their symbol. Okay. But Moses somehow prophetically realized they're going to leap from Bashan. They weren't assigned Bashan when they, drew to, when they got their assignments uh, uh, under Joshua. They were, they were west of Benjamin but couldn't handle it with the Philistines. So they went up north, found a place up at Leish, and, and moved up there. But Moses predicted they would leap from Bashan, that is from the Golan Heights, and they became very closely affiliated with the Phoenicians, became a seafaring group, strangely enough. But it's interesting, uh, the, 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 uh, um, when after, in, in the days of the judges, uh, after uh, the, they, uh, they left their allocated territories, Deborah is really upset by the ones that didn't help and says, gee, Dan didn't even leave his ships. He'd become a seafaring crowd. What's he doing on ships? Dan is omitted from the genealogies in First Chronicles. You begin to, as you study your Bible, discover the tribe of Dan sort of gets the backhand of the Holy Spirit all through the Scripture. He doesn't even show up in the genealogy in First Chronicles. All the other tribes do. He also is not sealed in the tribulation, as we've just noticed. The twelve thousand from each of twelve tribes are sealed to protect them through the tribulation. Dan's not protected. Wow, he's in bad shape. Well, not. Why is it? Because Dan was the tribe through which idolatry entered the land. That's in Leviticus 24, Judges 18, and where else? Where, and so on. Dan, up in Dan was where one of the golden calves, one of the two of them, were put. He was a leader in the apostasy under Jeroboam, 1 Kings 12. And also a hundred years later, he's a leader in the apostasy. He's the voice of calamity, Jeremiah calls him, and Amos also, in the Hebrew that is. And there's a curse on him in Jeremiah 8. You see, De uh, Deuteronomy 29 says idolaters are going to have their names blotted out. Dan's name is blotted out. 
So we find in Deuteronomy 29, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve other gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood and come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. Notice, lest there should be among you man, woman or family or what? A tribe, and a tribe bears that burden, among others. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smote against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Ooh. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. That's Deuteronomy 29, right? Well, that sounds pretty grim, doesn't it? And yet, let's not be too hard on Dan. Genesis 49 also says he will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. So he's not going to go away. He's just going to be unprotected during that period. Dan inherits. He's the first one listed that inherits the land in the allocation in the millennium in Ezekiel 48. Well, he's listed first because it goes from north to south and Dan just moves to the north. But okay, he still inherits. So that is any serious student of Revelation picks up on Dan because Dan is not sealed of the 144,000. What other tribe is not mentioned here? That's sort of a, that's a tricky question because there's, tw there's 13 to choose from. 12 are listed here. And one is Dan, not listed. So is there a 14th? Not exactly. There is a tribe listed here in incognito. You see, where's the tribe of Ephraim? It's there, but you can't find it unless you know what you're doing. Yeah, you see. See, the problem here is we got Manasseh and Joseph both listed. Joseph got a double portion. He had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, right? And so if you've got Manasseh already sealed and you've got Joseph listed, what is there? Well, Joseph equals Manasseh plus Ephraim. So Joseph less Manasseh must be equal to Ephraim. So Ephraim's there, but not by name. His name is blotted out, but he's represented. Wow, that's kind of cool. So Ephraim was also associated with Jeroboam's idolatry. Where were the two calves? One in Dan and the other at Bethel, right? Okay. So we're in the first stage. They die in the spirit first, according to Spengler's model, when it forgets God and begins to worship that which is not God. The worship of race. Remember what happened to Germany. The worship of material prosperity. Who would that be? Your, your second guess doesn't count. The first step is when God consciousness dissipates or worse, is deliberately removed. Prayer. No prayer in the schools. Outlawed in the early 60s. Bible reading. Even identification with biblical principles. Weapons diplomacy quickly replaced dependence upon God. Ask the average American why we were so strong for so many years. They, well, we had a good economy and we had a good military and they missed the real point of the whole exercise. Hosea continues, next verse. And now they sin more and more, and they have made them molten images of their silver and their idols according to their own understanding. And all of it, the work of craftsmen, they say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Being of the two calves. They're paying homage to, is the idea. The, as the Ephraimites and the other Israelites that, represent, that are, they represent here multiplied their idols and images and added to their guilt. They debased themselves even further by kissing the calf idols in conjunction with their many sacrificial rites. They didn't just kiss them, but they had these offerings and sacrifices and so forth. And there's lots of references to that. So now we're to second, stage two. Next, the soul of the nation dies. Its national character deteriorates, lowering the moral climate, accelerated corruption of the leadership, breakup of families, materialism, increase in crime and violence. Is that deteriorated in our country? I spent 30 years in the public boardrooms. I've been on 12 public boards. And the ethics in those boardrooms was a, was a model. And my, my, my biggest adjustment going from that world to professional Christianity was the lack of ethics among pastors in the, in the so-called professional Christianity. But I'm also, that, 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 was, more, that was a long time ago, my, my experience with the boardrooms. It's pretty clear as you watch the papers that the ethics in those boardrooms today is a far cry from what it was when I was active in the financial community. My word is my bond is something you could bank on. 
Those men may not have been moral in the sense they might have been cheating on their wives for all I knew. Never found that, that out. But you could bank on their verbal commitments. Companies were formed. M Multi-million dollar projects were uh, launched on the basis of a handshake and verbal okay because you could trust each other. Not today. You can't even trust it if it's in writing, so sue me is the attitude. Break up of families. The divorce rate among Christian families is no better, probably maybe even worse, than the secular world. Materialism, increase in crime and violence, on it goes. Failure of even the government to keep faith with its people and other nations. We could go through a whole list of those things. One measurable example of the failure of keeping faith is the debasement of the currency. They had inflation of 50% in 10 years. Oh, that's awful. Ours is about 13% per year. And the last six months, we've had 300% increase in the money in circulation, which will ultimately result in that kind of inflation. Boy. Another failure is to, a failure to honor uh, treaties and trade agreements. Well, we reputed, we, we, 44 nations met in Bretton Woods in 1944 and agreed to peg their currencies to the dollar on the condition the dollar was backed by gold. We got to 1971, we discovered there's five times as many dollars printed as there was gold in Fort Knox, so we reputed that commitment that all the other nations of the world had, had banked on us honoring. We, we, we closed the gold window as the expression goes. NATO was defined as an Atlantic alliance. On its 50th birthday in 1999, it redefined itself. Uh, the, and that redef re redefinition violated every previously accepted international law, the Helsinki and, or, and the Vienna Convention of 1980 and the UN Charter and even our own War Powers Act. And our, I won't go through our tattered support of Israel where we've betrayed them. And there are books written on the way Western espionage has betrayed Israel. We think we, we probably are distinguished as being most uh, uh, supportive of their right to exist. No question about it. But our own history is pretty miserable. All you need to do is spend some time with some of the Mossad or some of these guys, and they'll detail well-known effects where J Jim Baker revealed the undercover agents so they were tortured to death the following few days. And now on it goes. It goes on and on and on. Anyway... Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor and as the smoke out of a chimney. All these metaphors or similes, I should say, uh, emphasize the transitory condition of the idolaters. They're going to blow away in the first wisp. Each one of these uh, similes are int tend to be ephemeral, not permanent. So we're at stage three now. The judgment of God would make these idolaters quickly vanish. It would result in the complete dissipation of the nation, and indeed it was. This final stage is when the body of the nation dies. It doesn't necessarily happen cataclysmic, you know, like, like Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, by a sudden or total. It can happen by degrees, bit by bit. The police become ineffective. The courts become technical battlegrounds where justice is perverted. Politicians pander to the elite. Schools cease to educate. Have you noticed any of these things going on? The population, oblivious to the trends, drifts into oblivion. One of the biggest shocks of, of 2008 is to take a snapshot of the level of understanding and education of the people that voted. It's astonishing to realize how most people at the ballot box had absolutely no grasp of what they were doing or the history of this country or what even the candidates they're voting for stood for. No grasp. Where were they going to get it? Not from their teachers. They don't know either. The only place you find any grasp of those things is people that were raised in military families. Anyway, verse 4, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. I am the Lord thy God. Boy, did that ring in our ears. That's all through Isaiah 43 and 54 and so on. The first commandment of the ten was lost in Hosea's day, how about ours? How about ours? I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of the great drought. See, once more, the Lord reminds Israel of his graciousness, his deeds at the beginning of their history. Their whole history is a testimony to his faithfulness in preserving them. He led them from Egypt. He cared for them. 
literally knew them, uh, in the wilderness and allowed them to feed in the promised land. Those are three major phases that obviously they were well aware of. According to their pasture, so they were filled. And they were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, have they forgotten me? He describes them as sheep or cattle grazing peacefully. In return for such blessings, they should have acknowledged the Lord as their God and Savior. Do we? Instead, they became proud and forgot him. Do you see why I'm seeing a parallel between their predicament and our own predicament today? All the way through here, you can ask yourselves those questions. Therefore, I will be unto them as a lion and as a leopard by the way. Will I observe them? I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. I will rend the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Wow, is that graphic? Does that sound like an angry God? Like a vicious and powerful wild beast, lion, leopard, or bear, take your pick, the Lord would attack his people, who are still, they're still being viewed here idiomatically like a helpless herd here. It's interesting, the same four animals here I portrayed, the lion, leopard, bear, and wild beast, are the same that appear in Daniel 7, but they're in a different order and may have nothing to do with that. I don't want to overplay that. I just point that out to you. You can look at it yourself. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Ironically, the helper of Israel would become her destroyer because she was against him. Where is America in all of this? Where is their parallel? If so, if there is a parallel, you decide. What should we expect? Is God going to use our enemies to destroy us, to execute his judgment? Possibility. God says, I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? And the, thy judges of whom thou saidst, give me a king and princes. When the Lord would come to destroy, no one would be able to save the people, not even the political leaders they had demanded from the Lord. I gave thee a king in mine anger, and I took him away in my wrath, God claims. That probably refers to the northern tribes' part in crowning Saul. Their first king, they, were, they had a part in his crowning, as well as their succession under Jeremiah the earth. It fits both ways. The, the took him away in his wrath probably refers to the cessation of Israel's kingship under the last king, Hosea. It would seem to fit. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. See, God has not overlooked Israel's guilt, in effect. Ephraim's sinful deeds were compared to a document which is bound up and a treasure which is stored up. Both figures, uh, through both figures, Israel's sins were pictured as something guarded carefully until the day of retribution when they would be brought forth as testimony against the nation. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up and thy sin is hid, but then it's laid out is the idea. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is as an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. Strange idiom, perhaps. Any basis for hope has all but disappeared. Israel had not responded to God's call for repentance during the period of grace that he had extended. The pro procrastinating nation was compared to a baby which does not come out of its mother's womb despite her strenuous efforts and labor. That's the, the idioms that are being used here. And the, the, the whole, the, such a delay will cause the death for both the mother and the child. The term as an unwise son is a strange idiom. It's referring to the baby seemingly does not observe the proper time of his birth and he is referred to figuratively as without wisdom, as if he's an unwise son. It's a, it's, he's using it idiomatically, obviously. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from thy, of mine eyes. This is one of the most troubling verses and yet one of the most provocative verses in the entire Bible. Hosea 13, 14. Traditionally, verse, the first part of the next verse has been interpreted as an expression of hope and a promise of salvation. Excuse me, the first part... It's the, it's the first part of this verse. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. I will ransom them for a power of grave. I will redeem. That sounds very positive, and it is so rendered in the NASB and the NIV. However, the problem with that view is it doesn't fit the context. It's sort of backwards. Hosea's prophecy is characterized by abrupt changes in tone, and such a shift would seem to be premature here, however because the, 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 this section appears to come, that, that, that shift will occur in the next verse, verse 14, verse 1. The next few verses, I should say. 
And it would leave this awkwardly connected with what follows. It, it turns out when you look at the context, it doesn't quite fit. If you look at this last part of this verse, O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. That's just the opposite, it sounds like, from treating the first two verses as positive. Okay? And that's why there are many that feel the first two statements may better be translated as rhetorical questions, implying a negative answer. You see, it's a, it's a shall I, res- shall I re- ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, I, w- I will be thy plagues. O grave, I'll be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. That makes a little more sense, it would seem, but it still leaves some problems. See, the next two questions then, where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? Would thus seem to be appeals for death to unleash its plagues and destruction against Ephraim. And that does not sound like a triumphal victory over death, does it? You know where that gets answered? This is an ellipsis. Remember we talked about ellipsis last time. This is an ellipsis of reversal. Okay? That, how do we solve this exegetical enigma? And there's a lot of confusion among the authors. Boyce and others don't know quite what to deal with this. The way you, whenever you run into something like this, When you study your Bible and you come across something that makes no sense, seems to contradict itself, whatever, there's a secret tool you can use. Ready to write this down? Put Jesus Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. And you'll discover it will just unravel. This happens to be an ellipsis of reversal. I warned you about that last time. Paul, New Testament now, Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, applied the language of this text in the opposite sense as a reversal. 1 Corinthians 15, you all know the passage, 55 and 56. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. What is Paul celebrating here? None other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ which reverses that ellipsis. Fascinating. Makes no sense unless you realize it's one book. It's an integrated text. You need to learn that. When your number's 21 and Moses puts up that brazen serpent on a pole on top of a hill to heal the people bitten by snakes, you can read the entire Old Testament and not figure out why on earth did God do it that way. It's a strange, bizarre way to try to heal people bitten by snakes. You don't understand it until you get to the New Testament, John chapter 3, where Jesus explains to Nicodemus, as Moses raised a serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. And you suddenly realize that was an anticipatory idiom of the cross. How could it be? Because God had in mind what was going to come thousands of years later. And uh, that, it's one book. You won't, the Old Testament is in the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is in the Old Testament revealed, or vice versa. Anyway, you work it out. Okay. Ellipsis of reversal is the most unusual, most dramatic ellipsis of all the ellipses we looked at, which ties Hosea's fabric to the centroid of the entire New Testament here in Hosea 13, 14. Ellipsis of reversal, a contrast where the ellipsis reverses or supplies an opposite sense from a preceding or succeeding clause. Ellipsis of reversal. It's the most, I know know of none others in the scripture, there may be others, but this one is heads and shoulders above the rest. Moving on. Verse 15, though he be fruitful among his brethren and an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness and his spring shall become dry and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. See, with the Lord's compassion removed, Israel's prosperity would come to an end. Oh boy. The Lord would come in like a hot east wind which dries up everything in its path. And the reality behind this, of course, is the Assyrian invasion as to, and the references to plundering and military atrocities make that very clear. It's interesting to visit the London Museum and see the, the uh, friezes and so forth of the Assyrian artwork of the incredible atrocities they did. We, we showed you pictures of that back there a couple of sessions ago. You can review that in your, in your notes. And by the way, in the Hebrew, chapter 13 ends here. Uh, there's a, 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 there's, we still, the, the, the chapter 14 starts next in the Hebrew Bible. 
Anyway, in verse 16, Samaria shall become desolate. That was the capital of the northern kingdom. For she hath rebelled against her God, and they shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. And we talked about that before. So these verses, last couple of verses here, correspond to the plagues and destruction of death mentioned in verse 14. The language is that of a covenant curse, of course. You can go through Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and so on. Refresh your memory on that. And that probably is because the linking of 15 and 16 is why the Septuagint and others included that verse in chapter 13 before shifting to chapter 14. In any case, the destruction would come, God said, because Israel had rebelled against him. So now we start for, for chapter 14 in the English Bible. Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Hosea's prophecy ends on a positive note. Chapter 14 is a positive thing after all of that. Understand that. He's calling them for them to return. It ends on a positive, with an exhortation to repentance. The word return here is a very, is shub. It really, it, it, it's a, uh, it, it's interesting. Hosea never tired of using this particular word. It's one of these overworked words here, if you will. Take with you words and turn to the Lord, take, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. There's that phrase again. The fruit of the lips. We refer to prayers of forgiveness as allusion here. Something is not truly learned until it results in changed behavior. Somebody ever asked you, what is, how do you define learning? Learning is defined, check your Bible, or check your dictionary. Learning is defined as the modification of behavior. You haven't learned it until it reflects in action. Through this final appeal, uh, Obviously, uh, 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 it, it would be rejected by the arrogant and stubborn nation. It would still instill a hope in the hearts of a righteous remnant and provide the remnant generation of the future with a model to follow. And that's going to answer something I'm going to raise here in a little bit, but uh, recognize that. Obviously, the nation as a whole would not take this seriously, but a remnant would, and that's to whom it's written. True repentance would eventually involve an acknowledgement of sin, and remember Israel's ultimate repentance, a very key verse. It's my favorite verse probably in the, in the whole book. And that's the last verse of chapter 5, where God says through Hosea, I will return to my place, which means he must have left it. Until they acknowledge their offense in their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That gives you a capsule of exactly what the tribulation is all about and why it's being a thing. Verse 3, Asher will not save us. Asher is the term for Assyria. Shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. See, no longer will Israel trust the Assyrians or any other nations. Nor will she call her handmade idols our gods. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. In the day of Israel's repentance, the Lord will turn from his anger and demonstrate his love by healing her. At that time, the Lord's blessing will return to Israel, is the promise here. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. It's going to, you know, it's going to blossom and be, and be renowned, for, renowned for her beauty. This is a complete reversal of the imagery that we were stumbling back there a couple, you know, back in 1315. His branches shall spread, his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. That is the cedars of Lebanon, obviously. Israel in her prosperity is also compared to a cedar of Lebanon, whose deep roots luxuriant gross and airy. Everybody's express, everybody's smelled cedar, how unique that is. We were well, known, were well known, and to an olive tree widely recognized for luxuriance, for the oil, and so on. They that dwell under a shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine, and the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. His shade or shadow could refer to the Lord's protection, where he's compared to a pine tree in chapter 4 back there and so forth. Kyle has some different notes here. It's more likely that Israel is itself the tree beneath whose shade the members of the nation flourish is his analysis of this. This seems a little more consistent with the imagery back in chapter, in, in verses 5 and 6, which compares Israel to the trees. The picture of Israelites again growing grain points to the return of covenantal blessing again. And once again, Israel will be fruitful like a vine and so forth. Small point, we'll move on. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. 
That's a contrast to Ephraim's earlier attack, which was just the opposite. And uh, I observed him. This again is that same word, sure. It was used as lurk in Bethesda. Here it's observing. Implies like caring for. Um, the same God who stealthily watched Israel like a leopard ready to pounce on its prey will now become the one who carefully watches over his people to protect them. That's the contrast that's implied here. He compares, God compares himself to a green pine tree. The Lord also asserted that he is the nation's source of prosperity. Your fruitfulness comes from me, he says, like a green fir tree. Who is wise and he shall understand these things, prudent and he shall know them for the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. So the book ends with a word on wisdom. One who is wise and discerning will learn a threefold lesson from Hosea's message. What is the threefold lesson? The ways of the Lord are right. Those are the same as his covenantal demands back there in Deuteronomy 28. The righteous walk, in, that is, obey them and experience the blessings of loyalty. The rebellious fall, stumble over them in the sense that destruction is the direct result of disobedience. So we're right back to the blessings and the cursings of Deuteronomy 28 and so on. The broken commandments become the ultimate reason for their downfall. And all this has to do with the character of God. Hosea threw out his entire, uh, uh, the, pro the profligacy of his wife and his country and his comprehensive exposition reveals all this together, reveals the character of God. His sovereignty in the first three chapters, his holiness in the next four chapters, his justice in the next four chapters, eight, nine, ten, yeah, three chapters, and his love in the last four chapters. Sovereignty, holiness, justice, and love. Now, he appeals to his audience not only to understand intellectually this prophecy, but to discern how that knowledge can apply to their daily living. So we can sit here sort of stunned. We sort of may perceive some parallels between the predicament of the northern kingdom and our own nation. The real issue that Hosea would appeal to is, is it going to change anything? You see, I could argue that Hosea's preaching was a failure. Really. Did the northern kingdom repent? No. They got wiped out. His contemporaries did not walk in the paths of righteousness, but rather stumbled into captivity. And I might say oblivion as a, as a nation. God has a very interesting verse in Isaiah 55, 11. We hear it quoted often. God declares, my word will not return void. Really? God's word will not return void. I used to puzzle over that. Because here's Hosea. We've got a 14-chapter book, right, that hammers away. Did it serve? Did it work? Did the nation, the northern kingdom, did they repent? Did they come around? No. So how is this word going to not be void? It's your problem. It's your problem. How can this be? Where will the fruit from Hosea's words, there's got to be fruit from Hosea's words, and it didn't come from the northern kingdom, did it? Ooh. From you. These words are for you and me. We need to be the fruit bearers of God's word. That's why they're here. That's why you're here. I do not believe you're sitting there listening to this by an accident. You're here by a divine appointment. And God, the fruit of God's word will depend on your response to that word. Ooh. Guilt, 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 guilt. We say it could never happen here. That was the cry in Eastern Europe, doubting that communists would ever take over. Boy, did they learn the hard way. That's the presumption that pervades in our own country regarding God's judgment. Can't happen here. That's the slogan of a fool in ignorance of God's nature and his commitments. We too live in a declining culture and God's judgment appears to be overdue. That's what Billy Graham said when he said, God, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Thomas Jefferson said in 1781 
He says, I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. Not a new idea. He again may use his enemies, our enemies, as his mechanism for judgment. Wow. Our only hope is not in our credit system, is not in our currency, is not in our military, it's not in our so-called democracy. It's in, it's in none of our only hope is in national repentance. In national repentance. America is in moral freefall. We are victims of spiritual warfare. We have a media that's masking the truth. The only purpose of media is to, to inform an electorate. And we have a media that takes pride in shaping opinions rather than informing them. And the way the media hid the truth from the American people during the last election is that we should not let those lessons be wasted. We need to understand what was really going on. We have courts perverting justice. We have schools deliberately dumbing down our youth. That's the plan. Check it out. We have replaced our traditional heritage with multiculturalism, revisionism, and values. Well, there is no truth. Then we wonder why our graduates have no grasp of how to find truth because they've been told it doesn't exist. Traditional patriotism is now relegated as an obsolete form of idol worship. As a Naval Academy graduate, that I feel betrayed. We referred to Spangler's work here earlier, but there's a life cycle of democracies that have been chronicled by many uh, uh, s scholars. They point out a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote for themselves largesse from the public treasury. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been in the neighborhood of two centuries. That was, the northern kingdom was 210. We're a little bit longer than that, but not by much. There is a cycle. Alexander Tyler, Edward Gibbon, Joad, Northcote Par Parkinson, Jim Black. These are just five examples of people who have chronicled the rise and fall of nations throughout history. These are all historians, similar to Spengler's book, uh, the, the Decline of the West. But these guys had all, they all had the same model. They all studied it. They all expressed it slightly differently. Let's take uh, Jim Black's summary. Starts with social decay, lawlessness, loss of economic discipline, rising bureaucracy. That leads to cultural decay, a decline of education, weakening of cultural foundations, loss of respect for traditional values. And then finally you get to moral decay, rise of immorality, decay of religious belief, and devaluing of human life. Have you noticed that anywhere? That's the pattern of all previous civilizations. They go from bondage to spiritual faith, from, spirit, from, from spiritual faith to courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, complacency to apathy, and that apathy leads to dependency, which leads you right back to bondage. Where are we in that cycle? There are a number of professionals that are beginning to conclude that it's somewhere probably between complacency and apathy, but with the spending bills and so forth, we're plunging ourselves into dependency and back to bondage. There's a deliberate agenda of the extreme left to bring us into a socialistic, to destroy the whole history of our heritage. There's only one exception in life that I've ever seen, and that's the pagan capital of the world, which was 40 days from ground zero. God declared Nineveh, the capital of the world at that time, that they were in 40 days they'd be wiped out. And then he commissioned a guy by the name of Jonah to go tell him that. We call him the reluctant prophet because he tried hard to go the opposite way as fast and as far as he could until God explained it to him a little more clearly. <laughs> and then when he did go, he didn't go with a good attitude. He didn't go like John the Baptist, unless you repent, this is, all these bad things are going to happen. No, 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 no. He walked through town saying, 40 days and you get yours. <laughs> that a real winsome message, right? There are ten, at least 10 miracles in the book of Jonah, and the fish thing isn't the biggest. The greatest miracle in the, New Te in the Old Testament, from, in my mind, is that the king, on spec, repented. No one told him to. He reasoned that, gee, maybe if we repent, God might change his mind. So he did, and God did. And it was phenomenal. In fact, Jonah then goes and pouts. It's a four-chapter book. You wonder, what's, fourth, what's that fourth chapter for? It's a great book with those three chapters. No, fourth chapter, Jonah is upset. He's sitting up there, I knew you'd forgive him. He's really upset. He was, a, he was a patriot. He knew they were Israel's enemies. 
So we, uh, we, we cling to 2 Chronicles 7.14. I've preached this many times throughout the years, and I'm not sure it's true anymore. But I want to lay it on you anyway. God appeared to Solomon and said, If my people who are called by my name... Now, the purist would say this is God speaking to Solomon about the nation Israel. And I agree. Denotatively, it applies obviously to Israel. But I believe a God is immutable, that He changes not, and He's announcing a principle here. If my people are called by my name, how many of you in this room are God's people? Hold your hand up. Praise God. I'm not going to ask the next question. How many of you are undercover Christians? Maybe your neighbors, your family never suspect you're sold out to Jesus Christ. If, the, if you were on trial as a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Probably not. No, this is as if my people who are called by my name. That's who he's talking about. If they'll do four things, I'll do three, he says. If they shall humble themselves, we know how to do that. And pray, we know how to do it. We may not do it enough, but we know these things. They humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now, that's not a head trip thing. That's a commitment kind of thing. That's a passion kind of thing. If my people are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Ah, here's the rub. And turn from their wicked ways. Wow. Then, apparently not only then, will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now, What's interesting about this passage, it's not addressed to the Congress. It's not addressed to the executives that are running Hollywood. It's not addressed to the pagan left in the quarters of power. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin. It's addressed to... The, the, the sins that are in the way of God doing what He'd prefer to do is the sins among us as Christians. That's what it says. If, if we will turn from our wicked ways, we're not talking about Hollywood. We're not talking about the administration in Washington. None of that stuff. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, whose wicked ways? My people's wicked ways. The estimates are probably the, 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 the founding of this country probably involved Christians of maybe 1 or 2% of the population. And they pulled it off by God's help. It doesn't take a majority. It takes us as Christians to show some tendencies to, re, to repentance. Then God says, will I hear from them? Apparently not until then in a corporate sense. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal the land. Oh, devoutly to be wished. Now, I've preached this for years. You've, those of you who are familiar with myself, you've heard of me seeing those same slides and hearing that same pitch. But I have to be honest with you. I may not be right about my next, what I'm about to say, but I can tell you what I feel. I think it's too late. I have this feeling that we've crossed the line. I think the judgment of God is unfolding. That doesn't mean it can't be reversed. And our challenge isn't to perfume the cesspool. Our challenge is to get people out of it by preaching the redemption that's in Christ. Many people right now are frightened and confused about the horizon, the credit horizon, the house markets, the, the, the investment community, and on and on and on. We may be on the threshold of the most exciting adventure on the planet Earth in its history. We might be on the threshold of the biggest opportunity for the kingdom of our lifetimes. If we've done our homework, we believe in the Institute that we're committed to the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, which we argue has nothing to do with vocabulary. I'm not talking about swearing. It's about ambassadorship. If you claim to be an ambassador for the coming king, you need to be prepared to represent him competently and faithfully. That's the name of the game. And what all of us need to do, yes, in view of the coming turmoil, is our preparations for our family. We should try to be as independent as we can. We should lower our cost of living. We should try to stockpile some emergency uh, provisions, what have you. Those are all worthwhile stewardship issues. But the primary thing we should be doing is reviewing our notes, getting in the Word, understanding the Word with a passion and an aggressiveness unprecedented in our lifetimes. And we need to recognize that the boot camp, we're in a boot camp for heaven. 
And our responsibilities in the kingdom are going to derive from our faithfulness here. And uh, so I urge you to re-examine all of that. Now, by the way, for a more intensive review of all of this in a contemporary way, I encourage you to take a look at our recently published briefing pack called Twilight's Last Gleaming. Where we, it, we, it's an update from one we did many years ago, but uh, much more contemporary, and it deals with specific things you can do and some resources that are available to you that may surprise you uh, for those that are really serious. So I leave that with you, and with that, let you and I stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for this message you have given us from Hosea. It grieves us, Father, to realize that we too have the capacity to grieve you. We're stunned to recognize that we cause you grief by our ingratitude, by our sins of presumption. Oh, Father, we repent of that. It grieves us to realize that we have the capacity to cause you pain, Father. We thank you that you have gone to such extremes on our behalf as to give us your Son for our redemption. Father, we confess before you our need for a Savior. We confess before you our need for that redemption. And Father, we also petition you for your Holy Spirit to reignite in each of us a renewed passion for your word, a new hunger for your word, that we each might indeed grow in grace and in the knowledge of our coming King that we each might be more effective stewards of the opportunities that you bring before us, that we could be more effective fruit-bearing. So, Father, we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. We commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King, in whose name we do pray. Amen.